She hosts the Mina Kimes Show featuring Lenny, a football podcast, and launched the ESPN Daily podcast in October 2018. The original host of ESPN Daily, Kimes remains a contributor in the NFL offseason. An acclaimed writer, Kimes has written many memorable features for ESPN. She penned the first ESPN cover story in October 2019, the incredible survival story of NFL wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins and his mother, when ESPN the magazine transitioned to a new digital format. Previously, Kimes co-hosted ESPN Radio's The Morning Roast, a national weekend show with Dominique Foxworth and Clinton Yates, which the trio launched together in January 2017. She has also contributed to ESPN Live Twitter shows, including ESPN Digital NFL Draft Cover since 2018, and more recently, the Sports Nation NFL Draft Digital Show in 2021. Prior to ESPN, Kimes was an investigative reporter for Bloomberg News and business writer for Fortune Magazine. Kimes graduated summa cum laude from Yale University with a Bachelor of Arts in English. In addition to her work with ESPN, Kimes has, a, has been a color commentator for local television broadcasts of Los Angeles Rams preseason games. And without further ado, I ask that you join me in giving a warm round of applause and welcome for me and Kimes. Meandering is a word I like to use, as though I close my eyes 
woke up one morning and I was sitting in a chair next to Michael Irvin arguing about the Cowboys. Loudly, as you can imagine. Uh, and I have always told my story the exact same way. In college, I knew I loved reading, I knew I loved writing, I didn't know what I would do with either of those things. I'm sure some of you who read English majors can relate. Uh, and before my senior year at Yale, I, on a whim, applied to an internship program at Time Inc., hoping that I would get placed at one of the cool titles like Sports Illustrated Time, In Style. So you can imagine my reaction when I was placed at Fortune Small Business, um, where I was tasked with writing about entrepreneurship and the policy issues affecting small business owners. Deeply sexy topics to a 20 year old. Uh, but it ended up being incredibly fascinating. And also, because it was a small magazine about small business, I got opportunities that I never would have gotten if I was placed at a larger title. From there, I was offered the opportunity to work at Fortune Small Business after college, and then I stumbled into my next opportunity, because in 2008, right after I graduated, the magazine closed. But an editor there liked my work, and he asked me if I would be interested in taking a temporary gig at the flagship magazine, Fortune, to write about finance and investing. I didn't know anything about finance or investing, and I was pretty nervous about taking a temporary gig, but I said yes, and as I'm sure you can all remember, this was the exact time when the economy, the financial world, was melting down, which was scary for all of us, but afforded me a front seat to one of the biggest economic stories of a lifetime. So that gig turned into a full-time job, and then after a couple of years of doing that, uh, a different editor assigned me another story, an opportunity that, again, I had no idea would come my way, which was to do an investigative story. Uh, it was about Johnson & Johnson and having some product recalls at the time, and the editor said, figure out why. And boy, that was frightening, uh, because investigative journalism means asking a lot of questions and being yelled at a lot, uh, but I did it. I took the assignment and I spent the next six years working as an investigative reporter. First at Fortune Magazine and then at Bloomberg News where I joined the investigations team. So from there, the meandering continues and actually takes a pretty sharp turn because while I was ostensibly a very serious business journalist writing about very serious things, I was spending pretty much all my free time watching football, like Sundays, Saturdays, Mondays, Thursday, and oh, every time. Um, I was posting on a football message boards, which I hope to God nobody ever finds. Uh, I was reading about the game as much as possible, trying to learn about the history of the sport. I was watching YouTube videos, studying X's and O's. I listened to like every football podcast on planet Earth back then. I still remember walking into Bloomberg News, listening to football podcasts, sitting down, working, getting up, putting it back in, walking out. It was an obsession. And that obsession became even more of an obsession when, in 2014, my beloved Seattle Seahawks made the Super Bowl. Um, so, around that time, again, I was still a business journalist, just to line you the timeline. I decided to write a personal essay about how that postseason run and just watching football in general had brought me a lot closer to my father. I didn't intend anything to come of this essay, but again, randomness struck, and an editor at Slate found the essay. I had published on my personal Tumblr, by the way, and said, hey, can I post this on Slate? And I said, yes. And then from there, some editors in the magazine found it, and they reached out to me. And I will never forget what the editor said. He said, you seem to be this very hardcore business journalist writing about very, very, very serious business stories. Uh, but we read this essay, and we looked at your social media, and it's mostly dumb football memes. So like, <laughs> we want to do this instead. And guys, I can't tell you, you might be sensing a theme here. This blew my mind. The idea 
that I could have this sort of, I guess, quarter career pivot is what you might call it, because I was in my late 20s at the time, and um, yeah, that I get paid to do it. It just never once occurred to me, it wasn't my intention writing that piece. But I said yes, because how often in life do you get to turn your hobby into a profession, right? And God, I remember feeling so, so lucky. The landing at ESPN, I wrote the magazine for a few years. I did my first cover story on Darrell Davis. I wrote about Michael and Martellus Bennett, I remember. I did a story on Antonio Brown. A lot of stuff there that I cannot talk about. <laughs> Um, Aaron Rodgers came to my house. I wrote about it. That was crazy. I went fishing with Von Miller. Didn't catch anything. I went bowling with Jalen Ramsey. He kicked my butt. I covered the Olympics in Brazil. I got to go to Korea three times to write stories. Twice about esports, one about backflips. I went to Spain to interview a young Luka Doncic. It was incredible. I could not believe this was my job. And I was even more stunned after a few years of writing about sports when some people at ESPN approached me and asked, would you like to talk about them, like, in public, for night? Um, in 2015, I was invited to join my first ESPN radio show. It was a fantasy football show. Uh, and I became, for the first time, a professional opinionator. Yes, that's what I like to call it. Uh, from there, I joined another radio show, you heard about it earlier, my friends Donald Foxworth and Clint Gates. And then that radio opportunity turned into TV opportunities. I was asked to become a panelist on Around the Horn, and Highly Questionable, all the shows you guys see on ESPN, if you watch ESPN. Um, so look, everything could have stopped there, and I would have felt like the most fortunate woman on earth. But new opportunities kept landing in my lap. In 2019, I was asked to help launch ESPN's first daily podcast, ESPN Daily. And then, a year after that, not long after the pandemic began, the network decided to reboot its daily football show, and a lot. They asked me if I wanted to join the new cast and acquire the new title of NFL becoming both the first woman and the first Asian American to hold that title. Uh, okay, so that's where my journey ends, at least for now. That is my current job, that's what I do for a living. I have told the story I just told you many times, and every time I'm always struck anew by how unlikely it all was. I mean, I don't know if you guys listen, but I've used the word lucky, pandering, haphazard, random, like a dozen times, which is how I always tell the story. Uh, but this time, as I was sitting down and writing it, and thinking about talking to you guys, I was struck by something else, which is how much I've misrepresented it. I mean, the way I described it to you, the words I used, it's almost like I was a tiny leaf floating upwards, buoyed by luck and the generosity and open-mindedness of others, and just so, so fortunate. And look, look, some of that is true, right? Because I do believe luck plays a big role in all of our careers, and it certainly did in mine. And I definitely benefited from the helping hands I received along the way. But in writing down everything that led me here, a story like I said, I've told many times, I realized it's gotta be it. I mean, I admitted so much stuff. For starters, I said I was placed in an internship to write about business despite knowing nothing about it, and that's true, but what I didn't mention is when I got that job writing about finance, I would wake up every morning 6 a.m. and read the Wall Street Journal, and I would stop every time I didn't understand something and Google it, which meant it took me like five hours to read the Wall Street Journal every day, but I did it because I wanted to learn. I told you I was asked to do investigative stories. I didn't aspire towards it, and that is true, but what's also true is when I got that first opportunity, I was hung up on like 20 times in one day. 
Um, and I'm a non-confrontational person, and being yelled at is not fun, but I stuck with it. I learned how to read financial documents to try to find the things I needed for reporting those stories, and I just kept plugging away in the face of rejection. I mentioned that ESPN discovered me through a personal essay that I had written. And yeah, I didn't apply to work at ESPN. But that essay, I spent days and days working on, not just because I thought it would go anywhere, but because I was passionate about my craft. And yeah, I was really shocked when I was given a chance to work in radio. But for that very first radio show, uh, I would take a car every morning at 5 a.m. from New York to Bristol. I would show up with pages and pages of very unnecessary preparation about fantasy football. And then driving back, I would listen to the entire show back, trying to figure out how I could be better. And finally, I was so lucky to talk about football for a living. But I never would have kept that opportunity if I didn't spend hours before every appearance studying tape, learning how to dig through stats, deeply worried of making a mistake and looking like a moron, and really working hard to maintain the title of national analyst. It's not just the title you get, right? It's one you have to maintain. But my, my point here is not that I worked unnecessarily hard or that I am more deserving of any of these opportunities than anyone else, but rather that I have realized only recently that for years, I mischaracterized my own journey. That in my retellings, I have constantly downplayed my own drive, dedication, and tried to obscure any sense of ambition. So in preparing to talk to you just now, I thought long and hard about why that might be. Candidly, I think some of it is cultural. I'm sure some of you can relate to that feeling of being almost allergic to self-promotion and how deep seated it is. But I also think it connects back to something I said at the very beginning of this, which is I never dreamed of doing this job because it did not seem possible for someone like me. And now, even after doing it for years, I often still feel like I don't belong. I am reminded of this pretty much every day. Um, I mean, not just because every time I go on the internet and look at my mentions, inevitably there is some faceless man telling me to go make him a sandwich. Actually, recently had a uh, uniquely racist twist on that. I said, go in the kitchen and make me some sushi, which is not only racist, but racist in an inaccurate way because I'm Korean. <laughs> like, you know, you're kind of racist, like, get it right, right? Get a lot. Um, but also just because over the years I let those voices trickle into my own thinking. I never wanted to be the loudest person in the room. I was always afraid of giving the wrong opinions. And I had downplayed my work turn after turn after turn for fear of coming across as anything less than humble. It's only recently that that's begun to change for me. At some point along the way, really not that long ago, I realized that in suppressing myself, my voice, my jokes, my takes, I was making my, worse, my work worse. And that in misrepresenting my story, I was doing a disservice to it. And that just because I was different from everyone else who does my job doesn't mean I didn't belong or that I just showed more gratitude and humility than everyone else. Over time, I learned to see my difference as one of my core strengths. So now, whenever I tell my story, whether it's to a boss, a friend, a room full of strangers like yourself, uh, I always strive to tell the truth, which is this. Have I been lucky? Absolutely. But luck is what you make of it, and I have done a hell of a lot with the luck that's come my way. And in doing so, my hope is that the next time a young woman or Asian American or Asian American woman turns on the TV, my job is their dream job. Not just because it seems possible, but because it seems probable. Thank you guys.
my gosh, you're hilarious. Thank you. And I love every bit of that. I have to say, I'm the same. I never ever thought I'd be in real estate. I actually, my mom did it, so I definitely said I never ever would. <laughs> not only did I not plan, I actually refused. And you know, as many of us have experienced, you were just an overnight success that took decades to build yeah. through hard work. So it's so much respect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, you know, your list of incredible interviews was astounding. And those experiences must have been completely unforgettable. Do you ever have a time where people reach out to you and and make you feel like you achieved that just because you're a woman, just because you're an Asian woman, just because you're beautiful? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> Much. 
And then after college, when I was living in New York, uh, writing about business, I kind of just fell back into football in a big way. And I think it was maybe around 2010 or nine or something. And I would just call my dad after watching games and we would talk about them. And that's the other thing about sports. It's like when you have nothing else to talk about and you don't really know whether it's with a stranger or a loved one, it's always something that you can connect on. So I would call him and we started talking more and more and more, and it really brought us closer together, and it just it gave us a reason to pick up the phone and chat, which is just, you know, kind of the most special thing I think we can have as a parent, shared experiences, and that's beautiful. Uh, as spectators, do you think there's a specific American sport that AAPIs gravitate towards, and why? Oh, damn. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I would say it's probably football slash basketball, just based on my experience, but those also are the most popular sports in America right now. So um, one thing, though, that's cool about football, I don't, I don't know how you guys, how many might know this, is that increasingly there's AAPI representation in the NFL and at the college levels, um, whether it's Kyler Murray, who's a quarter Korean, wearing a Korean flag on his helmet, Taylor Rapp, who's a safety for the Rams, who's half Chinese, increasingly young way who's the Falcons kicker, who's awesome. They're, they're more and more we're seeing guys around the league, not only Asians playing football, but Asians playing football who are really proud of their backgrounds. And that is really cool to see. And it feels like a kind of sea change in professional sports. I love it. When you're out there, you're like, yeah. 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 <laughs> I actually loved that Twitter that you had posted, that tweet that you had posted. Uh, it was, uh, I wish we could have shown it. We just didn't have the quality to be able to show it. But it's hilarious, you guys. She has a great follow. If you do not follow her on Twitter, please add her now. And you are, but so is your mom. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> How did your mom get into tweeting? Um, so my mom, you know, I talked about my dad, but my mom loves sports as much as my dad, if not more. And, you know, for a long time, her total Twitter account was basically just liking everything I did and retweeting everything I did and posting, like, grainy screenshots of me on television. <laughs> um, then she, she went on to play in a soccer. She's a big Tottenham fan, and she started to group her because of um, Kevin and Sim, son, pardon me. And um, she started just tweeting about it and kind of gained this weird following, and now she has like 27,000 followers. <laughs> that was so boring because it's a dark place, you guys. And I'm like, oh, please don't look at. It's mostly wholesome. I'm like, don't look at, don't look at my replies ever. But also like her own replies. I, I feel so protective of her. But she enjoys. She likes connecting with other fans. Oh, that's beautiful. You never, you never thought your mom was going to be a, a Twitter influencer. Not me. <laughs> I think there's hope for all of you. <laughs> oh, so many of us have experienced a lot of pressure from our Asian families to certain tried and true career paths. I know that I'm looking at a lot of people who are supposed to be nurses, doctors, engineers. How did your parents react when you first told them that you wanted to be a journalist? You know, um, they were pretty open-minded about it. Uh, I think getting into Yale helped because they're like, all right, you're good, you know, you don't have to worry, even though they probably should have worried because I wasn't actually sure what I wanted to do with my degree for a while. But yeah, I, I loved writing and reading so much from such a young age that I think they would have been shocked if I had done anything else. And I had always considered creative careers. Um, but yeah, and it's funny, I think people always assume my mom being Korean it has, would be more of a you know, hard charging mom, but really my dad is much more driving the train on getting into college and all of that sort of thing. And I'm, my mom has defied stereotypes in a lot of ways, aside from being a Twitter influencer. Um, she's a very creative person, very funny, loves the arts, and uh, you know, I think that was, I, I, I told you guys I didn't know I would do what I'm doing for a living, for certainly, but I think having a parent modeled that sort of creativity and maybe going off a little unbeaten path was pretty important for me. That's beautiful. Well, she has done an amazing job because you've broken through so many glass ceilings. 
What is the toughest challenge that you have had to face throughout this journey in such a male-dominated industry as a woman? Oh boy, as an Asian woman. Yeah, where to begin? Um, well, I'll say this, you know, I, I talked a lot about how uh, a lot of my challenges have been almost self-inflicted, and that's certainly true, and I think, I'll never forget the last time I was on an ESPN discussion show with Sports Nation, which doesn't exist anymore. The producer was getting in my head, going, interrupt, 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 because you have to interrupt to make your presence known on some of these shows. And I just couldn't do it because I was so nervous. I was like, who wants to hear from me? Who wants me to talk over, you know, Marcellus Wiley or whatever? And, um, you know, that was something, it wasn't any, nobody was not making space for me. It was me not making space for myself, quite frankly. But I'll also say, you know, there, there was some external challenges as well, not being taken seriously. I mean, when I first started, doing TV as a journalist um, and talking about football, I was not asked to talk about X's and O's. I was really only asked to come on if there was a story involving domestic violence or a serious issue or women's things, which you know, I, I, I love talking about those things and thinking about them, but I always knew I was capable of more. Um, but the idea that someone with my profile could also fit that role didn't occur to a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do think, I, I, I will say, I do owe a lot of my journey to people being open-minded and being outside the box and recognizing that, like, this role doesn't have to look like this. And they we're still working on that at ESPN and other places in sports, but even from just a few years ago, I think we've come a long way. Thanks to people like you. So being immersed in this very masculine field, right along that same line, does it affect the way that you express your femininity at work? Do you feel like you have to like downplay your girliness or you know, things that you're into? You, could you go in there dressed like this? <laughs> <laughs> I could. Everyone would be like, whoa. <laughs> Actually, probably made me more feminine insofar as uh, I didn't know how to wear makeup until I was on TV, so that was uh, quite a change. Uh, and just learning how to like, be a performer was just not something that I thought about at all. But yeah, I think um, you know I have always been a little bit self-conscious about um, wanting to seem not different in terms of identity, but totally from the men around me. And at times, I actually think I strove too hard to prove that I was just one of the dudes. Um, you know, I remember for a while, like, I have a wild laugh. It's weird. And I feel like we're gonna have to, like, get that out of here. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like the hyena got punched. So. <laughs> you definitely, somebody's gotta make it laugh. And I would catch myself and stop because I didn't want to stand out as being different. Or another thing, and this is more about the femininity side, I would always try to keep my voice from going too high because I was worried I would be perceived as shrill in a debate show. Let me tell you, it's very hard to keep your voice low on first date, but I tried. Um, and you know, I think on the lines I was talking about. Mm, as the more I'm on TV, the less and less I try to fit in and be exactly like everyone else. And it took a while for me to get to that point. Absolutely. That is incredible. I think what you do here for us today is give us permission to be ourselves and you know, experience imposter syndrome and just move through it and just keep going. Everybody experiences it. You know, we all feel that way. We all have traumas and experiences that we've been through that have this little voice in the back of our heads. But seeing what you've been able to accomplish and the things that you've been able to get through in, in very dominating fields, uh, it's very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
With the, with the incredible visible platform that you've built over the years in your career, what social impacts or systemic changes are you passionate about sharing with the world? Yeah, I really try to use my platform to talk about issues bigger than sports. And the thing is, most issues, social, cultural, political, racial, like they do intersect with sports constantly, um, but when I feel like I have the opportunity to speak out, especially when no one else is, frankly, um, I, that's when I feel free, all the times I said lucky, that is when I feel really lucky that I have that megaphone. And a lot of times, you know, I, this is actually where I do feel like my identity um, is what makes me stronger in those areas because if it's an issue involving gender violence or women's issues or sexual assault or anything like that, I recognize that, yeah, I'm on TV every day, most 99% of the time, I am talking about, you know, zone coverage or whatever. But this one time, because I'm me, because I've thought a lot about this, because I've talked to people about this, I am going to speak out on this issue. And that's also true when it comes to issues involving Asian Americans, which doesn't because that quite so often with professional sports, but um, you know whether it's talking about South Asian hate or the successes of Asian American pioneers in sports, I do feel, not a burden, but the opportunity to celebrate and talk about these things because of who I am. And again, that's a really, really special gift that I've been given. work to grow the same kind of education awareness and uh, you know true change within our system but we we really need the assistance and the visibility of people like you so thank you very much for being there for our community I do have one very important question from Justin Wong who introduced you and you know before we start to close this out I, I have to ask you Dory is not going to ask you <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> um, so, Justin would really like to know what are your thoughts on McCaffrey getting traded? <laughs> let's go! Let's go! Let's go, Jordan! Um, I think that it was very surprising. Um, I would say two takes if I was on TV that I would say today. One is it reflects the fact that the Niners very much so believe they have a Super Bowl caliber team right now. Yeah. Undoubtedly, Christian McCaffrey, who's still playing at a very high level, will make that team better. I'm excited to see him, particularly in this offensive scheme with their head coach, Kyle Shanahan, who I think is one of the more brilliant run game designers in the NFL. It's very exciting. However, um, <laughs> don't move me. Uh, I was a little bit surprised that they gave up so much, given that the aforementioned brilliant run game designer seems to be able to do it for like six rounders. But you know, when you're all in, you're all in. So they just got to get healthy. But when they're healthier, when Nick Bosa comes back, they are a force to be reckoned with. Awesome. about my fantasy football team because I don't know how to do very well. I just don't know what to do. But, um, you know, I, I want to say just thank you for opening doors and breaking through all of these glass ceilings. And uh, for me, I have three young girls and I grew up without seeing women like you on TV, achieving, um, having these high profile and uh, respected roles, and you know, it, it is your your brave and bold ability to keep moving forward through any negativity that people put against you that gives me the opportunity to show my daughters. I'm, I'm gonna cry. Uh, <laughs> show my daughters uh, that truly anything that they want to do is possible, 
and that they don't have to necessarily be a doctor or a real estate agent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Can we have a hand for the